If I were you, I would keep a lower volume. Or doesn't matter, you know, Henrik. Nobody can hear you scream. <laughs> These guys are at it again. Welcome to the Flick Lab. The Citizen Kane in space. Kane's son episode. Yeah. So, just so that our, our, our dear listeners are, are on one page with me, I did try my best to make sure that this episode would not happen. I tried to have, the, have it cancelled. I tried to have this episode postponed. I tried basically everything in my capacity in order to make sure that we wouldn't be here today, but what can I say, Kari was adamant in his his stance that we should cover, cover today's film. And that is really unfortunate for basically everyone, because we all know Kari's stance when it comes to remakes. So please, please, dear listeners. So therefore, today, unfortunately, Kari has to be vicious. He has to pretty much butcher today's, today's cinema. I, I, I've said, Kari, please don't do this. It's, it's a, the, the Alien is a, is a classic movie. It's one of the cinematic masterpieces. You could look this past, past your fingers, but what, what can I say? What can I say? Man has to stay through to his commitments. So, Kari, Kari, I'm, I, I'm guessing you, you just, you just have to hate it, call it out as a remake or, or a rip-off of It the Terror Beyond Space. I I tried. I tried my best. Apologies afforded already. Yeah, okay. To be frank, I was thinking about it today. I was going through the list of possible influences towards this film and, and It popped up. And I have to say I've probably never seen it. Except all the other ones, of course. <laughs> so no harm done. Unless you were suggesting that this is a remake of Citizen Kane. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm already placing my bet that you, you will hate the film based on the fact that it, it kind of is a remake of it. No worries then. <laughs> Can't complain about what I haven't seen. But everything is inspired by something. Have we even watched any remakes in this podcast? Oh yeah, we have the Rob Zombie remakes, basically. You? Where to start? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last episode from Poland for now. And therefore I took the opportunity to take you to the noisiest place as possible in the Wozienki Park, where I was recording over, over a year ago, uh, this German film, Die Brücke. And I decided to take you on a new torture round with all this background noise for the celebration of summer and the celebration of not being, not having to talk through a mask. So, we are here again. What about our lives, you son of a bitch? <laughs> what about our lives? They suck and everything is miserable. <laughs> so, welcome to some strong Freudian sexual undertones today. E extremely strong in today's case. I'm Garry, and you're Henrik. The last time I checked. And this is a failure. <laughs> Why? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. No answer. That's what I'm expecting. Uh, this podcast is not monitored by Whale and Yutani Corporation for use and accuracy. I just checked. This is the kind of film podcast where you will detect micro changes in air density as soon as we get warmed up here. We can be found on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and don't forget to leave us a zero-star rating. Why did we watch this film now, Henrik? I really don't know. I'm, I'm actually like, I'm, I'm asking you that very same question because Alien essentially it, it's a film that already has has been talked to death. Anything that is to be said about Alien has already been said at least twice or thrice. 
So why exactly are we looking at Alien? Uh, are we looking at the same movie? I thought this was this uh, Anglo-Saxo-French 1967 drama artsy dartsy film. Yeah, 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 precisely that. That's also what I'm referring at. Uh, nobody has fucking seen that Ripley Scott a atrocious cinematic piece of shit. Oh, heavens no. We wouldn't turn into such a pile of dumpster fire in this podcast. No. We no, Christ, like, we, we have, at least we have some, some, you know, level of quality in the films we pick. And the time frame at which we look at films, because, of course, this is the big, big anniversary, 41 years of Alien. So that's why we are looking at it. The wide premiere was on 22nd of June, 1979. The very first premiere was, limited premiere was on May 25th, 1979. Well, yeah, this is the type of film podcast where we actually miss the real, the actual anniversary, <laughs> and then we do this, this haphazardous, well, it's, it's the 31th anniversary episodes, like hacks that we are. <clears throat> if I were you, I would keep a lower volume, or it doesn't matter, you know, Henrik. Nobody can hear you scream. <laughs> except, except the film critics of, of Finnish Broadcasting Station today, <laughs> who, who are absolutely right, bear in mind. Bears are frequently on my mind. Uh, at the premiere in the courtyard, there were various props from Alien. It was quite of an experience, and, but it was plagued with technical problems in the sound department. Uh, therefore... <laughs> kind of like this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> also, also very much alien and playing with sound issues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, once they got the sound issues in order, it was a kind of a success because people were actually, actually quite horrified. What's your history with this film, Henrik? Seen it more <laughs> times than I can actually count. <laughs> Or, or remember at this point. I am a big fan of, of the film, uh, even the franchise itself. I I do find something enjoyable and something to defend in in all of the films of the main franchise. Mm. Like the, the, the original and and the first sequel, Aliens. They, they are of course they they are classics and nobody ar argues with that. But I'm I'm in the like camp of of one that are also enjoy even though they are extremely faulty movies the parts three and four Ooh. at least to some extent Ugh, resurrection it it, 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 it it has some some good ideas there it it, it where it kind of suffers most is is at times extremely French cinematography and unintentionally hilarious scenes but but overall I, I would say it's it's not any kind of a masterpiece but I I do say that res even resurrection it, it is a better movie than its reputation I have had really a lot of hate towards that film but if I could say something positive it has some of the best alien design in the alien franchise that is, of course, helped by the technology at that time. You know, Henrik, since we both have seen this movie like gazillion times, the first Alien, I think we can skip some of the usual jargon because everybody knows already kind of everything about this film. Let's just keep it a little bit more free-flowing if we can. Well, there, there is an attempt, at least. Yeah. I mean, I mean la last time we were, when we were free-flowing... <laughs> It, 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 was, it was a fucking experience to everybody. Oh. But you know what? What can you say? It, 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 it was it was a surreal film. <laughs> the fuck you are supposed to do with that kind of material? Well, to do an episode that kind of mirrors that film. Um, I'm sorry for everybody, yep, yep. for our listeners, for that treatment. I don't know how you are still here. <laughs> Well, 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 I, 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 I can give you an answer at least on behalf of my mom. She most definitely is not. <laughs> I, I, I've noticed that a considerable number of people has has blocked me on Facebook recently. 
I don't know if the if, if it was that episode, but the time frame kind of fits. <laughs> How was your first experience with the first alien? Somewhat underwhelming, I must confess. Same. I, I, I once again, like the movie was made before I was goddamn even born. So of course, of course, once I finally got to see Alien for the first time, the the hype had been all around me for years before my first first experience with the film. So kind of goes to logic that of course the film couldn't live up to the expectations. But uh, I was I was sold this extremely effective, complete nightmare fuel, the scariest movie you will ever see. And what I got was, well, surprisingly tame sci-fi horror film when compared to the hype. And it was it was only later on during repeated viewings when I finally once again got, got more of the chance to approach the film from a, from a fresh table, so so to say. And when I finally started to actually see the all, all the positive sides of the movie. And when I finally actually started to love the film. How old were you? Oh, what would I have been? I don't know, maybe 14? Yeah, yeah I, I've been around the same age, maybe. I had this friend Kalle who had a, a, like a huge passion towards the sci-fi genre and collected a lot of or recorded a lot of films from the TV as it was during those times to VHS and, and that was something that uh, one of those movies that he wanted to show to me is something that you just have to see and uh, him being a huge fan of Babylon 5 I didn't know what to really expect but the first experience was that it's a it's a very slow movie and it's uh, that it's unnecessarily dark in cinematography and the mood and uh, very slow but once you get a little bit older get past puberty and all I think you find a lot of more more interesting aspects around the film the roots are of course in the Dark Star science fiction comedy film written by the same guy as tonight's film Dan O'Bannon I've seen it like one and a half times perhaps <laughs> and uh, never was a big fan it's, it's, it's one of the best sci-fi comedies ever made, man. Are you, God are you serious? It. I laughed like zero times. I was like, when is this shit going to end? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but that, that's only because, you know, laughter and enjoyment, they are both emotions. And you are as emotional as Ash yeah. in today's film. Yeah, nothing funny about that film. Don't check it out, dear listener. The script for the film was first called, or in the early stages, called Memory, then Star Beast, then, thank God, it was changed and behold, Alien. Possible sources of inspiration or likely sources of inspiration include The Thing from Another World, 1951 version, because the John Carpenter version wasn't out yet, thankfully. Forbidden Planet, 1956, Planet of the Vampires, 1965. And a short story book, Junkyard from 1953, Strange Relations by Philip jo Jose Farmer, 1960, Easy Comics, and Sold as a Jaws in Space. 1979, of course, was a year when a lot of Star Wars influenced films were popping up. This is also the same goddamn year when Moonraker was pushed out. Yeah, and, and Star Wars pretty much is the reason why Alien even exists. Basically, today, everybody already knows the, the, well, let's just say, problematic history of getting the film produced. The script from O'Bannon originally was unsuccessful in, in the pitching stage, and it, it finally kind of got some notion with Brandywine Productions and their head, Gordon Carroll, Walter Hill and David Chiller and it's Chiller and Hill who actually finally managed to get the script picked by 20th Century Fox who did, yeah, take the script in but then just sit on it and didn't do anything with it until Star Wars came and, and made sci-fi once again a huge cash market for movie studios and at that point and when that happened 20th century fox became kind of a desperate on 
well, what sci-fi scripts properties do we have to get to get one some of that Star Wars money? And basically, the only script that they found from their desk was well back then called Star Beast. And even though they didn't really like the script, they, they essentially they just have to go with whatever material they could quickly get on their hands. So Star Star Beast was picked for for shooting and that's basically when when the rewrites and and well the whole shift into from star base to alien started to happen excellent excellent i want to say something about the actors we have captain dallas the the selfish hero to save the day played by tom skerritt the Corey weaver yeah. Fuck. <laughs> because 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 dallas can't save even his own ass in 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 today's movie, oh, what, what does really say about the cast and crew? Uh, Scott, I I don't know. M many people say that Ridley, Ridley Scott made made this decision his decision to cast general unknowns to the film as some kind of a artistic choice. I'm pretty much pretty sure that Scott was just trying to save some money from the budget because because the visuals and effects kind of really burned through the past when when this one uh, when alien was in production but yeah back in the day um uh, even though today a lot of well-known hollywood names like tom scarrett Sigourney, Sigourney weaver john hurt appear in the film when alien came out most of them were relative unknowns and what 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 career they had like bigger bigger parts they existed on stage like for example Sigourney Fever who was a stage actor mostly b before his alien role as Ripley from from the whole folk Ian Holm who plays Ash was was the biggest name in the cast back in the day yeah Bilbo Baggins Bilbo Baggins but when Patchett also in those films. Yeah, known for budget roles. Pretty much villainous roles also. What to say about Sigourney Weaver? Well... She, she has made those alien films. <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically, the most simplistic way to sum up Sigourney's acting career is just to make state that she has made those alien films. Ellen Ripley is, is her most well-known character, but on top of that, she also was in, in James Cameron's Avatar. Yeah. Uh, and Galaxy Quest and all those other films that has aliens in them. And those goddamn films, Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2. Yeah, Ghostbusters which almost had aliens. <laughs> and she's gonna appear in the Avatar 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Avatar train just keeps on going. If if James Cameron someday still manages to get a budget, with this going, I'm not sure. This could be kind of hilarious. Yeah. Maybe maybe Avatar Two is going to be considered a bit of a like a pilot film. Then it will tank like hell, and then the rest of the films will never come out. I, I don't know, I don't know. The biggest hindrance for Avatar 2 is that Dances with the Wolves was, was just a one film and not a series. So, camera is kind of out of material. I, I guess Avatar 2 would have to be Schindler's list in space. <laughs> Moving on to Veronica and her card rights. Anything about her playing Lambert? Really didn't want to play Lambert, believe it or not. Head of the part was actually originally auditioning for to play Ripley. Yes. Uh, I've heard she even considered dropping the project when she heard that she would be Lambert. Felt that Lambert was way too emotional and and well downright hysterical throughout the film and only agreed to do the part after after Ripley made the argument that what I, that what the Lambert's overbearing emotionality actually is it is the conduit for audiences mm. emotions in course of the film yada 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 and that's how Cartwright fi finally agreed to do the film yeah today perhaps most best known for Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds Witches of the East Week and Scary Movie 2 
There's a fucking career for you. <laughs> that sneaky snake Ridley Scott. But actually, she did a really great performance. I, I'm not faulting her for that at all. And she was able to give the scares for the audience for added effect. So she has a role here. Uh, she does. Un unfortunately, the role, her role is something that I consider maybe be the weakest aspect of the film. Really? Never liked Lambert at all. Haters the character. Hmm. A bit annoying, yeah. But at the end of the day, just mirroring Henrik. <laughs> Harry Dean Stanton. What about him? Appeared in The Green Mile. Appeared in Green Mile, appeared in, in Repo Man and Inland Empire. Good job. Then we have, of course, the superstar of the night, Jafet Kodo. Born in 1939, appeared in Live and Let Die. So, what a surprise that I would know. But, this but man. Let, let's, let's not hold that film against the man. Uh, that alien, no. No, absolutely not. Oh, yeah, great guy. But there's one film that I could hold against the man. And that would be Freddy is Dead. Yeah, that unfortunately he was was a thing that happened. <laughs> I, I, I I don't know who, who is more sorry sorry about the fact everybody who has seen the movie or Koto himself. Yeah. And then we have about the time to move on with this podcast. Would it be scene by scene? Well sure, why not? And unless you wanna you know, take us through the Troubled production, all the behind the scenes, shenanigans, and all that jazz. Yeah, well, there is a couple of those. Alien was filmed over 14 weeks from July 5th to October 21st, 1978. And, dear listeners, if you didn't know, there's H.R. How do you pronounce this name? H.R. Giger. Bar Museum in Switzerland. So if you ever go to Switzerland and you want to drink your beer with a bunch of dildos staring at you, go to H.R. Giger Museum. No, but it has a lot of, you know, phallic symbols and all of that H.R. Giger all around the building. So recommend it, even though I haven't been there, but my uncle did. Okay, moving on. Alien is a rape movie, Henrik. It is. It is also, also a film of a of men giving birth. Yes, and it it, it it is essentially it is Arnold Schwarzenegger Jr. before Schwarzenegger Jr. It's kind of a point of view. It's like aliens giving blowjobs. It is, and surprisingly, it it wasn't originally supposed to be that. Not not even not even goddamn Geiger's own own design table back when he was doing the sketches for the film. So the guy. Though did go kind of phallistic and uh, straw dogs and I spit on your grave have been for for some said to be kind of spiritual bodies of alien. I wouldn't push it that far. That's really ridiculous. But basically, sexual assault apparently is what's happening here. And instead of the usual shtick that there are leading ladies who are running a, uh, away from the male baddies, this is kind of a switched situation and apparently because uh, homosexual activities are so loathsome or scary these are used for effect here as well because there's something really homosexual about this <laughs> whole film never occurred to me I, I also wouldn't really watch for a homosexuality there is the, the sexual attack angle that that comes in with with the creature and overall imagery of of the film there, there is also the turning of of the sexual narrative or, or turning of the female body narrative on on its head and and mirroring it, it now to to male characters like there, there, there is like you already mentioned that there is the rape there is pregnancy there is birth and even in some aspect there is is a theme of motherhood e even in the first one it becomes way more stronger in the sequels but there there is this kind of a mother mother bond that exists in film and most specifically with with the with the crew of nostromo and the computer which is literally called mother and there is also the the otherness 
and and the theme of of seeing a female body as somehow mysterious and other and all of that is at play in in alien but i i wouldn't still i i wouldn't vouch for for the homosexual aspect even though the the body narrative here is flipped because in the end of the day the xenomorph it, it is basically it, it does not have a gender right. it is somewhat under under creature and basically the whole homosexuality aspect would demand that you would qualify the xenomorph as a male and i'm kind of really on the on the edge on on the on the question what gender is is the xenomorph i would actually almost argue that it's more feminine than masculine Right. Appearance-wise, uh, I might fall into the same direction with you. So, in the first sequence, we see the commercial towing vehicle, the Nostromo. Crew of seven, refinery processing 20 million tons of mineral ore, returning to Earth. Except not. It has taken a little bit of a course towards a planet where they are going to be inv investigating. Well, blah, blah, blah. You know. Everybody knows what's happening in Alien. Interestingly, the Wayland yutani film, Wayland yutani Corporation is never mentioned during the film, but you can see it on the monitors and around the ship, so it wasn't an invention for the second film, it's there. Extremely great cinematography, of course, is uh, one of the biggest hallmarks of, of the film, and why it works and why it rises above, you know, typical TV movies. And I wouldn't even say that Alien is a B-movie. Alien is not a B movie, but Alien has the B movie Gino. I would say, what well, what elevates Alien on on a top of your average B movie? It, it, it is the the direction, the cinematography, and most of all, it is the production design. Yeah, this is a labor of love. Well, so 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 are many B movies. <laughs> like I kind of hammer home my point. I, I I would say when it comes to the genetics of the film, Alien very much is a B movie. What what kind of saves Alien is just the fact that it happened to have 20th Century Fox. This is going to hit, hit the big screens budget behind backing it up, and because of that, they can actually afford buying a hell of a lot more cooler shit than your average B movie. I like the long crossfades when they are getting out of their hypersleep modules because it, funnily enough, not only the slow movement of the character, but this long, long crossfades kind of telegraph to the audience that this is a kind of like the great awakening after a long hibernation without saying a word. There's a breakfast in space or whatever time it might be. I would call it a breakfast situation. Dallas talks with mother, which is interesting because given the position of Dallas, wouldn't you say that he would be able to know what is going on with this whole alien program that the company has going on? That he would have the same information that the science officer has? Uh, absolutely not, because Dallas is nothing mo more than can for them. Although, for, for Palin to Utani. Although, if you look at the director's cut, it gives even more indication that Dallas is willing to side with Ash wherever possible. And you could see that there is something nefarious going on, but yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, and, and even, even with the director's cut, when, when it comes to Alien, the, the, you kind of have to ask yourself exactly how much you are going to count for, for the director's cut. Because Scott himself kinda is, is against the director's cut, preferring the theatrical cut instead, feeling that the added scenes to the director's cut to do kind of drag, make the film drag and, and just make it overly long, and the information that you get in, in the added scenes really doesn't make anything for the audiences. Yeah, yeah. Not notoriously, the, the added scenes that we today have were added into the film pretty much against Scott's wishes simply because when the film finally was released on DVD and Blu-ray and started to be collector's cut and there started to be the 
quad trilogy boxes and all all that nonsense in that mo- moment in time there actually had to be something added to the film yeah yeah and because of that the scenes got added yeah so essentially as Ridley has said both the theatrical and the director's cut are director's cuts and Ridley himself prefers the theatrical cut but as you said uh, was it when the quadrilogy box was released they were kind of obliged to push something additional out and there are now different cuts of all of the four films and interestingly the, the first cut of the film the rough cut of the original alien was about three hours long would be nice to know what kind of a shenanigans they had up their sleeves there and whether these scenes exist at all anymore I would guess that the, these lost scenes would have something to do with kind of bragging off about the technology of the ship, showing more of the tech aboard. Other than that, I don't see what else you could put there, like more breakfast scenes? <laughs> I don't know. Um, perhaps more character building, because character, e- even though the film often is is uploaded for, for its characters and the way how the ca- uh, it builds its characters, I do kind of feel that a lot of the characters are somewhat one note, mm. somewhat even say cardboardish, and they really is, I, I I don't see all, all, all that character that everybody else claims that there is in this movie. Yeah, I think they built them pretty well uh, within the two hours. So. They they built them them pretty well to serve the function that they had in this film. Yeah, which is essentially be food for xenomorph and somehow get us to the or or, or the sci-fi horror action parts or parts of the film and and we briefly finally have have the hero that that kills the beast for for that purpose. Yeah, yeah, they they are relatively good characters. Like they work well. To serve that purpose, but once again, I'm. For example, I'm kind of hard to say what the fuck is Lambert all about, or, or what what are the two main technicians of, of the ship all about, except you know getting getting a pay raise. I know what it's all about. It's about getting into the film. One of those repeating uh, words. This time it's right. Right. It's the repetition word of the 1979. In 1978 it was totally. Uh, Ridley Scott was filming the Nostromo model shots and made slow passes. And the art director Les Dilly created 124th scale miniatures of the planet's surface. Nostromo had three models. It's not our system. This is where they're looking where they are. And then they are planning what to do once they have this information. They have this acoustic beacon that repeats for 12 second intervals. The name of the planet is never given to us. However, it is in one of those early scripts and it's called Acheron. Once you get to aliens, it's called LV-426. Also, when you look at the director's cut, you get the strong feeling that nobody would send these dumbasses to space together. I mean, they are so unprofessional and they are fighting about ludicrous things. Would never happen. Yeah, th- then again, essentially what what the job boils down to is, is galactic garbage drivers. <laughs> that, that, that it is, especially Parker and Brett. Or they are the, they are, they are the technicians. But yeah, but I, I, I really don't know, like, how high-end technical job flying these crafts would be in in aliens future yeah it's very artistic shit henrik they take the spacewalk wonderful models everything comes together perfectly it's claustrophobic it feels real almost like a documentary but why would they attempt to res- do a rescue mission on an alien ship maybe this bird would like to tell us well, it's it's never actually stated out that what they would have to do is is commit a rescue mission. It's it's stated that 
they are, but the, the law mandates that they have to check out the source of of the transmission. Now, now, now that they have picked it up, but what what they're supposed to do with the transmission? Yeah, well, that's never actually made clear. Yeah. Uh, also, something that I k- kind of really love in, in in this, we found found the spaceship. See a sequence of, of of the film is exactly how unfazed the the whole crew of Nostromo is the fact with that they found an a- alien spaceship and and an fossilized alien. Like right. when, when once they actually reach the space jockey's craft, they all are oh well yeah here's a craft. And when, once they found the dead space jockey, they are just like oh yeah well that that's an alien life form. Yeah, yeah. Nothing special. I kept thinking the exact same thing when they get to the space jockey or see the spaceship. And well, my thoughts were that this is nothing new anymore in the times that they are living. I forgot the year that this is supposed to be based on, but 2000 something. Yeah, the, the, the space travel obviously is all over the place. Seeing how already mundane things than like, well, essentially being a garbage man or or digging ma- minerals has a- already a- also made a spacecraft needing duty as as Nostromo is. So I I guess I guess that in in Aliens universe they they have found and seen more than enough of alien life forms and and space travel is so mundane that there is nothing lux- luxurious and nothing exciting and exotic in it anymore. Well, there's definitely nothing exotic or luxurious. There's nothing luxurious for sure about the Nostromo, which indeed does look like this kind of a retrofitted ship that has some kind of an ancient technology, uh, but it seems to be working just fine for their purposes. It is. It, well, I know that it's made in 1979, but the whole feeling is that or I think the attempt as well is that to suggest that this is some kind of a really old ship, but somehow with technology that can actually support their life there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like and and on that part, I I do actually see the similarities with with Dark Star, which was Penn's pre- as, as stated was pre- Penn's previous script, because both films share the element that. That space travel has become mundane, and and the theme of we have these down and gritty blue collar workers on a spaceship. Because also on Dark Star, the the spacecraft essentially was a piece of shit, and everybody was so used to the space travel that the crew on Dark Star also felt that it was nothing except you know driving a bus at this point. Right, and this was supposed to be kind of the Dark Star, but serious version of Dark Star. So here we go. Yeah, yeah, and and that you can actually see see in in, in the film. Dark Star is very strongly in, in Aliens script genetics. Space jockey Henrik, did you want to always know what the space jockey is about? I definitely didn't. Most definitely not, and so I'm. Extremely happy that Ridley Scott later on went back and did over two hour long film to give you a lackluster explanation on what the fuck was the space jockey. And it turned out that it was some kind of a three meter long Kratos looking motherfucker that just had a helmet on. Yeah. Fuck you, Ridley Scott. Oh, oh, that happened. Never gonna watch that film. No, just kidding. Of course, I've seen it and. <sighs> Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a guilty pleasure film for me. Like I like I said, like I said, I I do find when, when it comes to the main line of the franchise, and that for me does also count for Prometheus and Alien Covenant. I in in all of those films, I do find aspects that I really do like, and I do also find them in Prometheus. Was the film necessary? No. Is, is it is it necessarily even Good. Not necessarily. Like there's a hell of a lot of problems in Prometheus, and even more so in Alien Covenant. But all of them have 
elements and aspects that I do really like. Yeah, there are always redeeming qualities in something. Not all of the Halloween films, though. Regarding music, Isa Tomita was Ridley Scott's number one choice. But 20th Century Fox wanted something more familiar and Goldsmith was then recommended. Honestly, I'm not always such a big fan of Goldsmith and my general view of the Alien soundtrack is that the guy really... Like ha half of the music, or let's say like 20-25% of the music is something that even fits the film and sounds very atmospheric and scary and fits the scenes. And the rest is something that they're kind of constantly clearly trying to avoid, as we know that Ridley Scott made the decision to replace the end credits music with something else that had nothing to do with Goldsmith. And also some music from Goldsmith's old scores were used to make the thing work, in, in their view. And I can perfectly see why when you listen to the Alien soundtrack. You could never in a million years say that this would fit into the film. It's kind of even sounds like some kind of a happy-go-lucky music at times. What about, what's your view? I have to confess, I never actually listened to Alien soundtrack. I, I do know it that it exists, but I'm, I'm kind of a difficult beast when it comes to listening to film soundtracks. As, as often they, like, like we have discussed pre before, the soundtracks often have the, the theme, song, in, in, in them, and that's the really good part, and then the rest of the soundtrack is just kind of there, like Indiana Jones theme is great, and the rest of the rest of the soundtrack is kind of, well, good and not so good. And, and the same goes with Robocop and Conan the Barbarian. I, I would say even even with Alien, had I would I ever listen to it? Well, looks like you're listening to the wrong soundtracks. If you listen to, well, easy target for me. John Barry is, of, he has really memorable tunes. And James Horner, even though I know that James Cameron and James Horner had a lot of disagreements and arguments during making the Alien soundtrack, which did happen to be a little bit lackluster in parts, I really, really liked some of the themes there. I'm a quite big fan of some of those things that ended up into the film Aliens. So anyway, to make the point home, there's a lot of great film music out there. How dare you say that you only are for like the theme music and then... But I know the feeling that there's so many generic soundtracks. I can't listen to the majority of the Indiana Jones soundtracks. There, there are the lasers in the egg chamber and they are from the rock band The Who, loaned from them. This is the kind of laser effect that I don't believe the franchi franchise ever returned back to. This kind of a protective layer for the eggs or whatnot. And I thought it was a cool effect. And I believe it's, um, it might even be some kind of an alarm. I always just th thought that it was, it was nothing more than a visual element in a sci-fi horror flick. The eggs themselves, though, in, in original Geiger concepts were much more vaginal in, in the shape of their opening, which was kind of a problem for, for the production crew who were afraid of alienating the more Catholic members in the audience. And later on, the, the shape of the eggs and, and the opening of the eggs, eggs were, were uh, at least partly redesi redesigned so that the Catholic audience members could actually, if necessary, see the shape of a cross and not just, you know, in your face, vagina in there. Maybe they made the right call. Yes, the, the... I, I would say, say also when comparing the, the original concepts and designs of Geiger. Geiger made heavy heavy changes to his his designs and I, I would say that the revamp designs often are better than his, his first go. Yeah, taking into account that uh, when there was this limited premiere on May 25th, there was a group of uh, religious zealots who destroyed, for example, the eggs outside of the theater. They were vandalized because, of course, they were the work of Satan. 
So the, there's the quarantine argument, the inner hatch is opened by Ash. Very unprofessional crew, they still could have also quarantined this guy after they had removed the face hugger. I mean, why, why didn't they do that? Just wait it out a bit. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a... Uh, like, in, in the film, Parker does propose the question. Why, why the fuck they don't just freeze Kane after he has had an unfortunate close encounter with the ex and, and the face hugger? Yeah, can I put a flag right here? I, I always wanted to kind of get a confirmation on freeze him how? To put him into hypersleep with that thing? Or freeze the whole body as in freeze in, in ice? Or what? I, 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 I would say put him in the hypersleep hyper and cryostasis with the thing. Yeah, why? In, in space. And, <laughs> yeah. Which I, w I would say, like, after, after breaking the initial guarantee that Ripley tries to impose on the crew, that would have been the second smartest thing to do. In, in in films universe it makes sense that that that's in, that's not what ends up happening because because ash but it's it still is like why the fuck didn't the rest of the crew just you know push through with the plan and just put Kane in in cryo well uh, that's one way to quarantine the guy you got a good point there yeah I mean, and and when it when it comes to the the first guarantee, uh, guarantee that the one that that Ripley tries to force on on Dallas and Kane, you know, had had Dallas been more grounded and not so goddamn histor uh, historical throughout the film, and would he actually see accepted to see the the sound of reason in in Ripley's logic? The, actual happenings of the entire film would have been avoided. The film itself wouldn't have happened if they would have just, you know, guaranteed, guaranteed Kane outside of the craft. Yeah, well, Ash has, of course, ulterior motives here. To inspect the alien that he, I guess, supposedly already knows a lot about. He either pretends to be very interested in this specimen or he actually is like, oh my god, never seen this before. Super. Yeah, yeah, Ash asked essentially sabotages every attempt to f from Ripley's end to, to be feel logical throughout the film but it, once again Ash's actions wouldn't have worked as well as they do in the film if Dallas would have actually managed to keep his goddamn head cool <laughs> the insides of the f chest burster or face hugger oh, no, yeah, the face hugger these are pieces of fish and shellfish to create the viscera, the insides. Yeah, uh, also the facehugger itself went through a number of different concepts in, in the course of the production. The first co concept from Geiger was something of a, of a I, I would say, a crossbreed with n snail and an octopus. And and it's, it's kind of a fingers that it has, they, they wouldn't reach over a person's head, instead it, it, instead the original face hugger would attach itself on, on your neck and on your on your shoulders. Mm. It's quite human human fit designed, isn't it? Like uh, it, it, it is, yeah, the, this, the, the later design is, is much more human fit. And even with this, the, the later Geiger design actually had the had the fingers on on top of the or rising from from the top of of, of the face hugger's head so they would kind of a close them over your head uh, instead of the sides of your head as it as it does in the final film and they with, with the geiger design it gave you much more clearer presentation of of an sexual act like somebody holding your from uh, holding you from the head and forcing you to perform Cunning lingus. I have a friend here, a pheasant. They search for the detached face hugger, find it. Here we have Ripley discussing with Dallas. Dallas explains that he went out five times with another science officer. They replaced him two days before. We left Thaders with Ash. And Thaders, according to Xenopedia at least, is uh, Mining world planet located in the Epsilon reticuli system, approximately 59 light years trailward from Earth. So, if, if you're into, you know, this 
extended uh, alien universe via comics and whatnot, I suppose that's the conclusion that you will draw from there. Or maybe it's also in some of those you know, early drafts or stuff that they wrote for a, the first alien movie, I'm not quite, quite sure. So they lift off with this uh, smaller spacecraft without repairing everything. Kane appears to be now okay, just kind of a memory loss. Then after a while Kane is not okay. We have the legendary chest bursting moment, kind of a violent birth if you will. Inspired by Dan O'Bannon's Crohn's disease experiences, where you have all kinds of uncomfortable feelings inside your stomach and body. Yeah, um, and this scene itself is kind of even today notorious for exactly how horrifying it, it is supposed to be. Like back, back in the day when they were, were shooting the film, Ridley Scott made the nice decision of not telling Veronica Cartwright that how, how, how the scene is going to play out, which means that in, in the scene when, when Lambert just all of a sudden gets a burst of blood in, in her face, and is completely terrified of what happens. That's at least part of that terror. If if the story is true, is real shock and horror from from Cartwright's end. Yeah, she was aware that there would be an alien bursting out, but nobody told told her about the bursting blood as well. Yeah, and apparently nobody told Yabet Koto, who plays Parker, either, because. He, on the other hand, was nervous for three weeks after his uh, after the scene had been shot. And when it came to the members of the film crew, well, once again, the, the legend goes that many of them became physically ill after having repeatedly watched different shots of the scene. <laughs> okay, funny, funny. It, it is, it is, but but it does give us give us the nowadays iconic chess burster who also in original Geiger designs looked a bit shit to be honest. I actually do like Geiger's designs a hell of a lot but I w do have to admit that the first designs that the dude made were not the iconic stuff that you actually get with the film. Yeah. Like the or original chess burster that we had in, in the drawing board, it, it was something of a... Uh, I don't even know how how to describe it. Like, Opanen's directions for Geiger when, when it came to designing the chess burster was to design something terrifically dangerous. The Opanen's original introductions when it came to the design of the of the chess burster was a small creature that bites its way out of the victim's body. And Geiger draw inspiration from his own nightmares. And the end result is kind of a mutated plucked chicken, I, w I would say. And it, it, it looks extremely goofy. It has these these long hands, and it it has kind of like a turkey like head and neck, and and it it has like a swollen body. It, I I would say it it's not something that I would prefer in Alien, and apparently neither did Geiger himself. But like Geiger also hated the hated his own own model of the creature, and went on record saying that that. Even I am not satisfied with my own work. But uh, unfortunately, his hands were so full at, at the time because even though Geiger was originally hired to just do, do the concept designing for, for, for the film, as, as the production went on, his part just kept on grew, uh, growing to a point where he eventually became the designer for the alien plants landscape and the derelict ship and the space jo space jockey and it, that that work actually even demanded that he had to be on set physically doing all, all those parts and and when it came to the chess burst, the Geiger was so busy with, with all that all that physical set stuff that he just didn't have the time to figure out how to properly fix the chess burst. And the designing task for the chess burster was in the end given Robert Dicken, 
who is the one who is to thank for, for the chest burst that we have in the film, which is often described as a penis with, with teeth. Yeah, isn't there some kind of a penis type of creature later in the series? So they kind of came up with uh, all of this more sexualized creatures later on. I'm not quite sure. Maybe in the prequels you have something like this. Some... You, you, in the end, you, if I remember correctly, you start to have xenomorphs that, that have some kind of a really small teeth. And, well, Geiger's own designs were also e- even more sexualized originally. Like, uh, O'Bannon originally hired Geiger for, for the film because he had fell in love with Geiger's collection of, of work. Uh, more notably, I'm guessing it, wa- it was the, the art book Necronomicon. And, and from there, the works Necronomicon 4 and Necronomicon 5. Geiger was back in, back in the day. Geiger was supposed to be busy with with the with the production design of of French production of Dune. But since that that film failed to get off the ground, Geiger was free and was ready to actually dig his hands in in Alien. And the final xenomorph was was Scott speak for, um, from Geiger's Necronomicon. And in those Necronomicon designs, the Xenomorph has a much longer head, and the end of the head is much more heavily a penis-like. And in, in the design, the Xenomorph is also holding something that looks awfully lot like a penis in his hand. And Scott Took, took the design from the Necronomicon and then just toned it down a bit. So when, when it comes to the sexualized aspect of, of the creatures, it, it has been there and it, it has been way more sexualized even in the behind the scenes shenanigans of the first film. To come back to the bursting, there was a bit of terror in the cinema. Some people were detected to go more to the back rows when they saw these horrible scenes and there was a case of one usher fainting when Ash is revealed to be an android. Kane is sent to space. Nobody wants to say anything at this funeral sequence because the guy probably peed in somebody's space cheerios or more than likely everybody is so dumbfounded by the latest events so nobody can think of anything. Great guy. Kane wasn't enough character for anybody to actually say anything for his absence. Not enough character development to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, those things can happen. The stick of incentive. This is the uh, like a shock treatment stick that they used to kind of zap the alien if they would come across any. But they only come across uh, the cat of the ship or one of the four cats that were used for filming. Yeah, and e- even in this film, like the film that takes place in, in far future, in, in goddamn space, and has a murderous alien in it, even in here, the cat manages to be a fucking piece of shit. Absolutely. We will really get to this. And now the droid dude also explains that he has designed this little stick stick thing for tracking moving objects, like super technology from the future. Yeah, that, that's something something with the film. Everybody o- always loves aliens aesthetics. And I'm I'm one of those people. I, I do say that that all oh, the tech in alien it looks really nice. But by God, I would absolutely hate to ever have to use any of the tech in alien. Like the computer room for mother, uh, it it looks very nice. It, it's a very good room in, in the video game Alien Isolation, but if I would ever have to actually try to converse with Mother, I would rather pretty much just shoot myself. Or try to get any of any of that, that analytical data readings from the sensors on Nostromo that they use, for example, analyzing to analyze the alien planet's composition. Like, oh, oh it, it just... It's just a string of numbers that go past you extremely fast. 
I would rather actually shoot myself than to be trying to read anything from that mess. Yeah. So, uh, Indian aliens technology it's completely unusable in my opinion. <laughs> I keep thinking about these same things way more than I clearly should when I'm watching. Yeah, when Ash is reading that screen and reading the composition of the planet, I'm always wondering, like, how are you able to read this? Are you already giving it out to everybody that you're some kind of a goddamn robot? Yeah, yeah, like, like, like how, how does 4766 exactly translate into a vol volcanic earth? <laughs> yeah, like, whatever it was. Volcanic ash or lava base. I can see it from this number here. Yeah, th this string of numbers that goes pa past you, actually too fast for you even properly read the numbers. But as much as I want to pay attention to these things, I always am willing to make crazy justifications why this thing would work. I was wondering if the numbers that uh, rotate on the left side of the screen are just uh, depicting <laughs> lava base numbers and you would see <laughs> see what it's trying to depict on the upper corner of the screen perhaps. It was a little bit dark, I couldn't tell. Maybe there's a sign that tells you that on this side of the screen, lava base, and on the middle part you will see an update for, I don't know, the composition of the air but looks very unusable indeed. Ripley also informs she has micro changes in air density in her ass. I suppose that's called a fart. But all they do is they find a cat. As mentioned, and they did a lot of hallway illusions here, using the same corridors for depicting different parts of corridors and adding mirrors to make the corridors seem longer than they actually are. Kitty, kitty, kitty. This is the rhythmic heart beating sound in the room where we see the full size alien for the first time. Really like it. Not sure what is the, what the hell is the source of this rhythmic heart beating, but it's there. And the cat has emotions when he his or she is like scared of the alien. And one spread gets lifted up in the air by this uh, homosexual monster. The cat is just like, I'm just happy it wasn't me. Like, phew. Just, uh, yeah, that's, this look on the cat's face is like, glad I got rid of that guy. Couldn't give a fuck anymore. I, I, I don't know, I, I just read a bunch of not giving a shit into the cat's expression. Yeah. He's, a, he, he's just, you know, coldly there staring a guy getting murder, murdered and he's like, yeah, now I'm seeing this. <laughs> Eric, have I asked you before, are you a dog or a cat person? I must definitely dog person because as as alien also proves cats are piece of shit animals. <laughs> they decide to use fire against alien. Dallas talks with mother again. How to destroy alien? The answer is don't know. Hands in the air. So Dallas plays the hero because Ripley is already like yeah yeah I'm going to the air air shafts because that's my thing. But then when Dallas says no 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 you're not going there I'm going there she gives. <laughs> Him this kind of a, what kind of a macho maniac are you here? Besides, I'm a strong woman, I'm able to do that. Look, fuck you, I wanted to go to the air shafts. Well, it, it actually is, is surprising this moment in the film when, when Dallas is the one who insists that he is to be the one who gets sent into the air ducts. Because up until this part, Dallas really hasn't done anything that brave in, in the film. But Dallas often being the character in the movie that that is kind of as hysterical as, as Lambert. Even though Lambert is, is more in your face hysterics, hysterics, Dallas is someone who is so afraid of confrontation that he is completely unwilling to actually make a decision of his own in in situations so and now all of a sudden Dallas is all about getting him him the flamethrower and going into tight corridors with a murderous alien life form yeah I, I just kind of felt that he was always siding with the ash the science officer and just didn't want to yeah like he said he said it himself he's there to do what he's goddamn told to do by the company and that's the end of that but then again as much as he wants to avoid 
the discussions, the, the confrontation with Ripley, he decides to go into the air vents later. This moment when Ripley says when they're discussing how to kill the alien, she goes like, shut up! This was a improvised moment. Somehow, I believe the that dialogue was not there. It just somehow happened. And I remember reading that there was some kind of a, a bit of a tension between the actors. Well, Sigourney Weaver was kind of a newcomer in the cinema circles. And I don't know if you remember anything about that. Not, not. Uh, about the tension between the actors in on, on the set. I think, thankfully, nobody started laughing or anything like that. They just carried on after this. Shut up! And it worked pretty well there. Finally, Ripley goes to Mother and gets the message from Mother that all crew is expendables. And they are there to collect the alien sample, and that's all. Kind of a wacky idea from the company, and now they're losing the whatever 200 million billion Nostromo for this little experiment. Yeah, it, it is, it is. Plot-wise, the whole plot twist that Wayland yutani the company in, in the Aliens universe, somehow is already aware of, of the Xenomorphs and, and the whole operation is just their skullduggery in order to get some cannon fodder closing up to, for, for the alien or, or more, more precisely closing up to the X for the whole, whole facehugger thing to happen. It's, it's kind of stretching it. Yeah, like if they know something about it or if, even especially if they don't know anything about it well, both situations apply here. They should, I think, send some kind of a special team who knows to at least how to prepare for this this alien in in, in some way to quarantine everything and uh, you know might know something about the life forms already. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in the film, Ripley speculates that Wayland Yutani wants the Xenomorph for their biological weapons uh, division. Yeah, that's all so, guesswork, but yeah. Yeah. So, go uh, going with that guesswork, like like if if that would hold water, and and uh, later films in the franchise make the case that it does. That's what we we on Dinani wants. Dallas in the air shafts, yeah. We can see him praying for a slight second there. What was really bothering me, maybe the most in Alien ever, was so. Uh, Lambert is so adamant to tell. Dallas that uh, he should go the other way. No, the other way! Like, how the hell can she tell where Dallas is going, especially when, well, we're in space, I know, but it seems that, well, gravity wise, wise Dallas is changing the floor downstairs. How would that be replicated in the radar that they're using? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the radar that they are using is, is a useless piece of shit. Yeah. Like, like the only functionality you get from that beast is is that it can it can show you is is the xenomorph near or or far. Like, like does the radar even pick up pick up the xenomorph? But to actually say what direction it is, is is it above you, below you? Is it on your left or right or in front of you? Like the. the the, the radar is completely blind to all of those questions, and you could kind of think that when when you are trying to hunt a murderous alien in in air ducts, that information would kind of be a big deal to you. Right? Yeah, yeah. This is really alien software that they are using. I don't know. Of course, if you're using this radar technology, it just might say that Dallas is now going downstairs in big capital letters as well. But regarding this. Uh, what you have, uh, how did you describe this alien pose for Dallas? I always thought it was saying, boo, I'm here. I, I, I know that today it's, it's being referenced as a, as a happy birthday to you, alien. <laughs> I, 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 I see where that impression comes from. I, I never actually share that impression. So to me, it's always worked as a jump scare. Or, or the appearance of Xenomorph itself. What precisely hasn't worked out for me that well 
and this is something that I, I've said in the past also. Is is the difference between the VHS and, and today's Blu-ray technology and the much clearer picture that you get with, with Blu-rays. And that's something that actually plays off repeatedly in Alien. There, there are a lot of dark hallway shots where you now on on Chris, uh, crystal clear Blu-ray you can actually see that the hallway is empty meaning that the characters are in safe uh, are in safety at least for for the moment and on the on the other scenes like for example Dallas in the air duct you can actually clearly see the xenomorph right there behind him before the big jump actually happens oh yeah the guy who is playing the alien yeah he's he's crouching right there behind Dallas and that's Something that you didn't necessarily notice on VHS because the image quality on VHS is what it is. But with the heightened definition of, of DVD and Blu-ray, the dude is actually extremely obvious in every single alien is hiding shot that the film has. Mm. It, it, it kind of works like it, it turns the film into spot the hiding alien game. Yeah, but and it's the original intention, after all, right? It's what they saw in the theaters. You're now well, referring to the VHS Master Race, of course. Was it? I'm not entirely sure, because we, with, with the added definition, uh, definition of... Well, because we, with the added image quality of, of today's technology, also the, the way or, or the experience you have with the film has also changed to the experience that you would have gotten in in movie theaters. This is something that plays very heavily, for example, in, in Disney's animated classics, where the whole color scheme or scheme of the film has changed with the Blu-ray definition and and with, with the DVD enhancements and all, all that jazz that goes into transporting the media. The, the colors in, in old Disney movies actually look very different on, on screen and on VHS than they do today on DVD and Blu-ray. And because of this, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to say in some cases, like with Alien, was that really something that they did see on a big screen? Did they really see the Xenomorph in all those shots? Or was it still hidden from, from their view, or at least more obscure and more in the back, background? Yeah, I suppose I was also happy to see, or lucky to see the hazy and uh, the kind of analog quality of film as it was seen in theaters before we turn, turned into digital, uh, digital projectors. So, yeah, it's a different experience different level of clarity sure now it's so stable the image that it's sometimes almost like it's not the film as you know it so I don't know but this alien guy is played by Bolachi Badejo or however you pronounce that this Nigerian guy 26 year old he was kind of a design student discovered by uh, the casting team and put him in touch with Ridley Scott and because he was so tall and so slim, slender frame, they thought that he would be a great fit for playing the alien. Yeah, interestingly enough, the dude never actually auditioned for the part, or even knew that the film was going on. They, the production teams just, by happenstance, managed to find him in bar one night. <laughs> and immediately, immediately thought him as someone who could play the Xenomorph, like you said, because of his height. Yeah, sounds like my casting. Go to a bar and just snatch some guy. <laughs> so, so, sounds like the typical way I, I usually make my living and some extra pocket money. <laughs> there was also the stuntman Eddie Powell and Roy Scammell, they also portrayed Alien in, in a few scenes. My god, dear listeners, you're getting the the entire soundscape of War Zone, since this is the third recording location for me tonight. <laughs> bar closed unexpectedly, the bar, bar closed and 
Now I'm on a bar bench like a like a homeless person that I almost am. Yeah, we, we can we can all clearly hear all the shouting and gunfire behind you. <laughs> You're giving us all, all, all the authentic Slavic experience. The flick lag experience. Yeah, so dear listeners, indeed the last episode from Poland. Next episode probably from Finland. Not quite sure on that. Let's see how the flight goes and if I if Finland still wants me to go to Finland then all should be fine. We haven't done many outrageous episodes about Finland, I think. Yeah, so all good. Not not yet at least. Not yet. That there's always tomorrow. <laughs> we have of course what I call the milkshake scene, Henrik. It's the fight with Ash and Ripley. Interesting meditative moments between a fight. You know, these moments are quite perplexing, but very cool. The Ash walking past the wind chimes as he's throwing Ripley around. A you know, weird, calm moment in the midst of destruction. Yeah, so, something that also is, is a bit weird is the logic of, of if, if you are having an undercover android, why the hell do you allow that model to actually sweat milk? <laughs> because Ripley just threw him on the on the mo- on mother's face, I guess, just a couple of times, and that was enough to make him bleed milk, which was actually real milk, as far as I remember. Yeah, but that's my theory, and Ash is a goddamn robot. At least the uh, wax Ash is. That's the weakest part link in the film, wax Ash, or whatever it was made out of. Yeah, yeah. The I I do upload the the production design in Alien, but there is one moment, more notably this this precise moment where the effect work really does not work and you can clearly actually see shot by shot what they are doing like the moment when they switch the, the wax head into iron holmes real head you can actually clearly see that moment you can you can see that cut happen uh, there is of course at least one excuse for this because uh, yeah it was a latex head and it shrank while curing and as a result it wasn't convincing but i would argue that it wasn't convincing to begin with but it could have passed in vhs but what you see now is not even passable in vhs <laughs> no no un- unfortunately not ashes effects are i i would say in in relation to the rest of the film they are laughably bad yeah as they get the information that this was all a big scam to get everybody killed and try to contain aliens that they can't contain with the help of an android who is completely useless, they start to look for possibilities to blow up the entire 20 million billion gazillion spacecraft and get into this small shuttle as they are now downgraded to three people. So no point anymore to hunt down the alien and save the ship. Well, I would do the same thing. I'm not saying that. There's this intercuts to Parker and Lambert doing their thing, collecting whiskey bottles or what the fuck they were uh, supposed to do there. And the outfit and the girl get attacked by alien, of course. The alien attacks Parker first. And then Lambert is a fucking idiot who just stands there and doesn't leave. Not even after Yafet Kodo's character has been taken out. What gives? Run? What? And second of all, after Parker has been killed and the alien approaches Lambert, the alien is uh, striking some sick dance moves there. So kind of a this weird side shot. Seems like the alien is kind of levitating towards Lambert. <laughs> it, it does. It, it does. It, it, it looks like it's floating all of yeah, a sudden. Yeah, the, the position of the arm is kind of a, in a way that it's time to dance. Which is kind of a interesting because the, when it comes to the xenomorph itself as, a, as an effect that they used in those close-up shots, uh, that actually still is 
pretty good effect work and it, it has lasted time extremely well. Like for, for example the mechanism that they, they built for, for the head, the, that, that six stretch shredded condoms that doubled as, as tendons to allow, allow the alien to, to curl its, its lips and to, to reveal the teeth and, and the polished steel that they used for, for the teeth. That all still looks, looks pretty damn good. And even the even the KY jelly that they use for for the the, the alien saliva mm -hmm. that you can see when when it curves it so it even even that it is still pretty damn good effect work and sells the seed extremely well. It's pretty. So it's it's kind of a curious that then you get these one or two individual moments the the wax ash and and this one shot that that kind of come out of nowhere and you're kind of just looking at this doesn't really fit with the with the level of quality that the rest of the film and its effects have yeah the biggest issue regarding the alien if any is that well i i love the fact that they hide the alien and they kind of have to hide the alien for many technical reasons it works great the biggest problem however is perhaps the jesus christ you fucking teenagers um is the thank you for driving that car is the fact that they're the the alien doesn't have uh, it, it, they don't let the alien really move much because they can't they can't really film the alien moving as the full entity in full speed as we see in the sequels like here is just the alien appears somewhere and has uh, pretty slow movement except uh, of course the small alien but the full adult size alien we don't really see any quick movements from the creature except of course when you know you just see a part of the character and it escapes into the air ducts yeah, I, ha I have to agree with you on that one. That is a bit of a lost opportunity because uh, the few moments where you actually see the alien moving, it's actually pretty damn good. Like the the dude or, or, or dudes playing the alien, they do pretty much top notch work in mimicking this this yeah. kind of a foray alien is body language and and movement and i i also i would have liked to see more of that stuff and i i think that the actors would have actually that they would have deserved the chance to see more of their body work on screen than what we in the end unfortunately ended up with yeah and again maybe not a problem it's just as we're watching this in 2020 it doesn't have the same effect that it had on audiences back in 79 and I didn't go to the back of my seat or faint or any of those emotions. It's a completely different experience for us and no can do. And uh, you could also argue that, well, maybe it's kind of, it doesn't have to tell everything about the way that the character moves and maybe that made the film all the more creepier for it, that the guy just appears and then seems to be off screen really fast it it works at times but there are those shots where where you for example get the aiding driver rising up from the crouched position and i i kind of love all of those moments yeah and i i myself i would have liked to see even more of that stuff yeah there is one shot where we see quite clearly when the alien is harassing Lambert and approaching Lambert. You can see that the alien is on two legs and for me that kind of seemed a bit off about alien's behavior. Suppose we have seen it in the other installments but whenever the alien is shown as clearly standing on two feet it just happens to look too much like a human or a guy in a suit to me i get that experience and it's um, i think in the sequels they play the character more out as some kind of uh some kind of a more like a four-legged legged creature that yeah is using hands and feet for moving around 
Yeah, they, they, they start to do that. They started in in Alien 2 where the Xenomorphs were using the air ducts. They themselves quite a lot and they were moving inside the ceiling of, of the indoor spaces and the, because of of the spatial limitations, there they they were repeatedly moving on on force and and kind of a, a, a crawling through through the space and in Alien Three. Well, the Alien Three makes the whole point about how how the Xenomorph morph comes from a dog and because of that it has the dog like movement. Yeah. Yeah, true. Parker and Lambert die and Ripley is ready to blow up the Nostromo. And in the director's cut here, it's after she has activated the ship to explode, she finds the cocoon nest where there are a couple of the members of the ship who have been cocooned and uh, uh, this always feels really unnatural. And that's why it was cut in the first place. Uh, the, because the, the alarm is now running, the audience is rooting for Ripley to get the hell out of the ship and not look at any cocooned characters. So th this uh, it's just something that doesn't work. And I was kind of wondering why you, you maybe maybe you could have played it differently, that you play the cocoon sequence first on the way, and then she goes to, you know, put on the explosives that could have worked better and uh, that could have i i do like the cinematography in in the cocoon cocoon scene but mm. i i too feel that the scene is a bit unnecessary there is that unnecessary there is also the point that i've never really understood why the cocooning happens like like these days it's it's taken that that the Xenomorph's goal was to to have Jonas and Brett face uh, uh, face Hugger and kind of a, oh, they are cocooned for reproduction purposes. But the, the whole reproduction cycle thing is not really introduced in Alien, and the scene itself doesn't have the Alien X in it, which kind of begs the question that. How the hell are we reading the, the X and the reproduction in the, this scene, in, in the first Alien? Right. That's definitely something that can be used better in a sequel. But although it kind of provides more kind of mystical quality to the character that we don't know anything about this, <laughs> how this animal works. It's I kind of love that it's kind of left up to your interpretation, although, of course, it's not in the final version, so... But it was still cool to see in the director, director's cut, and I wish we could see even more. The director's cut is, was it one or two minutes shorter than the theatrical cut? There's a few small moments here and there that have been changed throughout the film. Like, for example, Ripley gets smacked by a Lambert after they get inside, back inside the ship when they bring the uh, infected character inside and things like that. And But these are still pretty minor changes, apart from the cocoon scene. Yeah, they, they are. Mo mo most of the director's got stuff that is there is, is, is something that even if you know what it is, you wouldn't be really missing it if, in the case that you wouldn't have it. Like, for example, Lambert hitting Ripley really doesn't do anything for the film, except gives it, like, 10 or 20 seconds more run time. Uh, except it gives the director's cut, once again, one of those moments that makes, makes the whole crew look like a bunch of amateurs, way more than the theatrical cut. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it does that, granted. Yeah, so the escape scene. Sigourney Weaver was discovered that she was allergic to <laughs> interesting combination of cat hair and glycerin, which was placed on the actor's skin to make them appear more sweaty. But then the glycerin was removed and she was okay again. Ridley actually wanted to kill Ripley in the original form of the story, but they concluded that uh, it would be much cooler that Ripley would still have the alien aboard. 
this uh, shuttle and have a bit of a final battle there. And it completely makes sense. And there were some kind of a there were a few of these two studio guys who tampered with the script and added the entire story of Ash the Android in it. And this time I have to say that uh, that is one of the very very key parts of the story. There has to be Ash the Android so that it's not just uh, about the whole alien chase. I think it makes it makes it a more mature script. That and the final battle in the shuttle, I think those are really important. I I do, I do agree at least with the fight in the shat, uh, shuttle. Uh, Ash the Android is it is an interesting concept and it it, it does work. In, in this film's context, yeah. Uh, the uh, kind of a nagging problem that I have with the whole Wayland Yutani uh, subplot is, is the fact that I never actually understood how Wayland Yutani comes into the conclusion that that they most definitely want to have the Xeno more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like as Ash refers to the Xeno more as a, as a perfect specimen and that that kind of a g gives me a, a, at least the the nagging feeling that Wayland Yutani actually is a corporation run by goddamn andro androids because the, the only perfectness that Ash can reference here is is purely genetical like it, it, it Ash remarks that the reason why Xenomorph is so goddamn perfect is because it is essentially a perfect killer it doesn't doesn't have a moral concept and it, it, it doesn't have well anything else except just its drive for to kill and that kind of begs the question how the fuck does Baron Titani know that unless they actually have have the notion that all that there is to a living creature is is genetics like aliens, the xenomorphs drive to kill. Its hostility, it stems from its genetical coding. It's it cannot be in this reading. It cannot be a so a social effect. It it cannot be any kind of a cultural effect from from the race that xenomorph is supposed to present. It cannot be a psychological thing for the xenomorph. It cannot have a mental drive for all that violence. Like, what if what if the Xenomorph would be a hive mind? Did did Valent Yutani ever think think about that? Did, did they ever take into consideration what if the Xenomorph is actually capable of thinking? Because yes. all of that could kind of limit its value as a perfect specimen, and all all that could be a huge problem when they try to introduce it into their bioweapons program. So the only way that Valent Yutani really sees Xenomorph. It, it is simply as as a as a combination of genetical material and everything that measures up into is Xenomorph good or bad or other bullshit. It's just you know it's stemming from genetics, and that's very much kind of a androidish way of looking at the, at the life and the living creature. It doesn't have a mind. It doesn't have a culture, a society, it doesn't have quote-unquote soul. It is just a combination of chemicals. Mm -hmm. I kind of felt that it was just a big corporation where it seems to happen so that it starts to kind of live the life of it by on its own, that nobody is really in control. It's just kind of a monster that you can't control a heartless one heartless monster often so just to follow the bottom line to make money and what i think they would have make, made money out of would have been to get some of the genetic code of the alien whatever it might be i'm not counting on it being dna <laughs> uh, and then just trying to develop something out of that and make some kind of a resilient killing machine that is willing to obey the orders of its Wayland yutani master race yeah, yeah, could be, could be that that would have been their plan. Uh, hard to say because the cell that Ridley Scott then starts to give you in Prometheus is, I guess, that at least the engineers who 
maybe depending how canon you consider Prometheus to be, their grand plan was just, you know, collect a bunch of eggs or something like that, black goo, and just drop it on, on you know, the planet surface that you want to mark for destruction and then just let it happen. Yeah, I, in many ways I think the first alien is a lucky break for Ridley Scott. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is precisely that. <laughs> Because I think there were a lot of implications and so many chances to fuck this one up. When you look at the director's cut material, when you think about the the early scripts or or some of maybe even the some of the Giger designs, the way that this film appeals to such of a wide audience even today, and is seen as some kind of a flawless film, it's just a huge amount of luck involved. I don't think it was even conscious to Ridley Scott what he was doing that well some part it was but for example that that the that the female audience would identify with this film as much as they did and that everybody found something from the film like the tech nerds found the technology and the horror fa- horror fans found the horror etc yeah i think you know all in all just things happened to amalgamate in a lucky fashion. Yeah, that, that's the reading I also have with the film. I, I don't really feel that this was 100% controlled, con- uh, conscious project from Ridley. Yeah, also kind of kept thinking about like how were they able to shoot so much material. Because the, the budget I think was still pretty decent and it was doubled from the or- original. They, if they had like a three hour rough cut and they had quite of a, f- a limited amount of time to film the film, kind of interesting, but also kind of is messaging me that they necessarily didn't have a very developed storyboard for the film. It was just, perhaps they were just shooting shit. Unfortunately, I haven't read the script, so that's all for me. Yeah, that, that could be. That, that could be the case. Because also, when, when you look at Alien narrative-wise, like when, when you look at the core narrative of the film, it's actually extremely simple. There, there is... Yeah. A- Alien isn't a story-heavy movie in any way. No, but like I mentioned, I think what helps here a lot is a bit of this added story, like Ash. Uh, but... Regarding the alien, now that the alien is in the shuttle, this is perhaps even more perplexing, the most perplexing of them all situation here. Like, just chilling here, found a nice corner to sleep, uh, amongst this all of these horrible killings, had nothing better to do. So wh- what is alien doing here? Just sleeping in the corner, out of energy, kind of lethargic, under the influence, perhaps, or got hit, injured, or what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, and and he's he's chilling precisely in in that one specific escape shuttle that Ripley herself uses. Right. Th- th- this is still the beast that has the whole cocoon nest inside Nostromo, and and here it decides to chill in in the escape shuttle because. I'll be damned, I will not believe that, that the Xenomorph has a concept of English language so that it would know that <laughs> the self-destruction is going on or even understanding of the concept of a, of a spacecraft a self-destruction countdown so that it would know that, you know, the, the whole goddamn spaceship is, is gonna go boo-boo and now you have to get to the evacuation shuttle. Well, this is something about Alien that is really fascinating for me because I, at least on my part, I never saw the aliens as as complete cockroaches. There's something to note for James Cameron, at least. I, I don't, and I guess it's also up for in- interpretation whether this whole ship that has the space jockey, is it kind of solely the space jockey race? operated ship and manufactured by space jockey people or did the aliens have a hand in developing this 
ship? Are they actually very intelligent beings? And maybe they fly around in space in spacesuits as well. What the hell do I know? Well, if 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 you go with the franchise, no, they don't. Like like they they pretty much are the the cockroach parasitic life form that just somehow ends up in these planets and then wreak havoc. Yeah. And and e- even 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 discarding all, all the rest of the franchise because all all that shit came up after the first film. I I still am hard pressed to believe that this xenomorph would actually be well even able able to even understand English language because it's it's mm. quite fresh. The only way how that in in my opinion would work out would be like like if if the aliens really would be a hive mind and there would be kind of a combined collective of consciousness that would be shared every single alien from the moment of their birth. But if that would be the case, then that would kind of mean that there would be more to the alien than just its genetic backing, which was kind of a... In, in the worst case, that could actually argue against Ash's notion that, that the xenomorph is a perfect specimen. Yeah. Yeah. It could also be that I'm reading a bit too much into these sequels of the franchise where you still, apart from the Kakarotian aspects you're given the suggestion that the the alien is extremely intelligent being it it at least it, it is made clear that it is capable of planning and, yeah. and stalking so there is an intellect into the beast and uh, that's I, I would say that's also the something that ca- comes obvious in in the first film because yeah. the aliens actually or, or the alien actually, at least in my opinion, it does pull off pretty good hunting tactics. That or, or then the alien is, is the luckiest bastard ever. I was meant to ask you actually, who do you think is sending the supposed signal? Or who is sending the signal in your, in your mind? Is it the space jockeys or is it the aliens themselves? And is it the warning from the aliens? Is it the warning from the space jockeys? Please don't come here because we have a crazy, psychotic alien having a rampage here and killing everyone, everybody. Or is it the warning from the aliens? Like, don't come here. We don't want anything to do with you. And why would you then do that? Wouldn't it be just better to have no signal at all? It's kind of weird. Yeah, my, my notion. And once again, this is something that is never given any kind of a defense for the film's end. That leaves the co- co- complete question completely ambiguous, is that the signal comes from that one space juggy that they found, find dead, and that signal is meant for other space jockeys as a warning, like, don't come here. Yeah, makes sense. So yeah, you are my lucky star, and... That's kind of it. There's kind of weird moments here. I don't understand why Ripley turns her head away from the alien and then turns her head back to the alien. It takes a hell of a lot of time to get things going. It it, it, it does, and it's it's actually a move on Ripley's part that kind of a creates a major hindrance for for her because now she can't see what the fuck the xenomorph is doing. Right. I I, I guess she, she just didn't want to see the alien move, move because she also had heard the reports that, that whenever the alien is moving it just looks like a really tall guy in a rubber suit walking around. <laughs> Who certainly likes to demonstrate its spy hole. Like when Ripley is putting on the space suit, the alien is uh, pushing his mouth out just to show off. Really, why, why would you do that? Yeah, I, I, I guess alien was was, was sleeping and and has just woken up. Now he's a bit drowsy. Yeah, like oh, <laughs> right, right. Some non-linear editing as well, like we see from three different angles when the monster of the night falls to his 
uh, I don't know, death, but falls into space. And that's it. Last survivor of the Nostromo. And Cat has its own hypersleep capsule. It's night night and roll credits. Business and premiere. 150 to 170 million leak or something like that. I've heard a little contradictory information, but over 100 million for sure. 20th Century Fox, of course, was trolling around, claiming that uh, in the 11 months since its release, Alien had lost the studio 2 million. <laughs> How can anyone even buy that? Um, well, the, well, that that's that's 20th Century Fox for you. Yeah, and this was done some kind of a f crazy effort to not pay the stars, or what was it? Yeah. I I don't remember. Was it was it because they wanted to keep money from from Brandywine? Yeah. Yeah. Those bastards. Still, those times before the internet, when you could even try to pull this kind of a stunts, but. <laughs> That wouldn't have even made any sense regarding the future of the franchise because, the, of course, if anything made, made makes sense, they would have wanted to make Alien 2 as they did, as Aliens and so forth. Yeah, do, 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 do Fox's defense, at this moment in time, they really didn't know that they are were going, going to want to make a sequel to Alien. I mean, no, no, nobody w knew that anybody would want a sequel to Alien. Ricky Scott himself didn't know that there would be interest in, in sequel to the, to the film. Yeah. Scott Scott being something that who is an adamant on the fact that he actually hates the sequel. Aliens, really? Yeah. He, he feels it's completely atrocious and doesn't actually count it as, as part of canon. And because Aliens is not part of canon if you ask from from Ridley. Also Aliens 3 and 4 are not part of part of the canon and therefore when Prometheus was under works that actually was it, it was kind of a Terminator Dark Fate situation where that film was then supposed to be the true Alien 2. <laughs> and oh boy how that went. Oh boy. My only problem perhaps with aliens is that it's not about the one alien anymore. The aliens are everywhere. They are kind of cockroach, as stated. And everybody who knows the franchise knows this argument. That they are overused and they are dying like cockroaches in the, in the hundreds. And it doesn't have that same personal effect that the first one has. But altogether it's a different movie and... I think that still works, this avenue that it uses, and after that it, the franchise kind of gets a little bit more lackluster, but for several several reasons which we don't have time for tonight. Favorite performance, Henrik? Well, no, no, no surprise to anyone. Sigourney Weaver. Well, actually I was on the verge between Veronica Cartwright and Sigourney Weaver, but let's just give it to Sigourney. Yeah, yeah Gar Garvard is also good, the problem is that, like stated, I just don't like Lambert as a character. Yeah, she did win some award for her efforts as well. I can't for the life of me remember all of these goddamn awards because they're everywhere. But she did. <laughs> Favorite shot. Yeah, I really like this, this, this first person tracking shot from Brett's perspective as the guy is going into the room through the doorway, the room where we see the full-size alien for the first time. It was kind of a cool tracking shot, I have to add. And also kind of reminded me of the alien games. Anyway, just cool. Okay, I, am, I guess I really like the dancing alien, but... <laughs> Favorite scene? Ah, fuck it, I'm gonna actually go with... with with the dancing aid and once again mm, yeah well perhaps the final scene favorite lines uh from my end it's going to be from ash when he's describing curry's heartbeat primordial deep code way <laughs> below the line <laughs> 
for everybody's surprise, I went for the emotional speech from Yafet Kodo's character Parker. I don't know, just the delivery was so rhythmic, almost like a rap. The damn company! What about the lives, you son of a bitch? Favorite kill. And that would be the chest burster. No yeah. question about it. Of course. No question about it. Random confusing question. Well... I'm, I'm ready to go into hypersleep soon. So, I have no input on this one. We, we can just skip the random confusing. What drew you out? I... Kind of actually nothing. Yeah, well I guess you could say that in some shots the film feels a bit... Kind of being like it's daydreaming a bit here and there. Kind of just wandering on. But it's kind of the or, part, part of the build-up that it's slow. Well, if anything, it's the ashes smoke up latex face. What drew you in? For me, most definitely the atmosphere. This is this oh, is yeah. this one has that kind kind of a really mysterious kind of a exploring feeling like atmosphere, and that is. Actually, the, the one thing that I like most also in Prometheus. I, I feel that the atmosphere is the best part of the film. Yeah, there, there was something on the benefit of that movie there, in that sense. What drew me in, it's kind of everything. I guess we should point out also the all of the alien design was, of course, absolutely legendary. And the fact that this film kind of transforms into into another planet, and it's so dark mood-wise that I was kind of turned off actually, originally when seeing this film by that, and how everything is so old and disgusting. Everything is dripping some disgusting shit, not just the alien, but it really moves you into this different world altogether, and I kind of I kind of dig that. Scissors of Sacrilege, what would you butcher regarding Alien? Uh, hard, hard to say. I really wouldn't touch that much in in this film. Uh, <coughs> and, and this is also a question that comes in with the to, to the th whole concept of, of, of different versions of the movie. Uh, um, I'm kind of with Ridley and the, I guess, common consensus that when it comes to the cocoon scene, when it comes to most of the director's cut material in general, I most likely I too would take them out from the film. They didn't bother me. This is not one of those cases where there's something in your face and something so obvious that goes somehow so against the film that you would immediately know that the film suffers because of this thing and this should be removed. And there is not even this one aspect that you would should be emphasized more and tinkered more in order to make the film better, like like emphasize some plot elements more to make the plot better. There is there is none of that, but I I do feel that the cocoon scene is a bit unnecessary in the film, and overall the director's cut stuff is something that the film doesn't necessarily need. So maybe got goes out for me it's really hard to say but if you could redo something then of course try to remake the ashes of mock-up face three adjectives to describe uh, from my end the adjectives are iconic because it is terrifying because it is and visual because most of all it is yeah it wasn't really a text file running on the screen for two hours no, it, it, it tried to be that, and then it realized that now, now we are go doing the visual thing. Yeah, yeah. apart from Ash having superpowers reading text screens, it tried something else. Mine would be otherworldly dark, because that's what it is, and groundbreaking. Did you look at your watch? No. Nope. Would you recommend this film called Alien? Absolutely. 
uh, glowing recommendation from my end. It may not be as terrifying as everybody keeps telling you in the interwebs. But it still is, like, it is the birthing place of a, one of the most iconic pop culture franchises that we have. It, it has a really great visuals in it. it. It is one of the more progressive and more feminist films of its era. It is a movie that, alongside with movies like The Terminator, changed the, the whole kind of a movie landscape. Not drastically, but it did kind of make the female action star and, and female star in, in cinema and especially in uh, sci-fi cinema which has had a, uh, a presentation problem for quite some time. It did actually show you that you, you can do a female main character, you can do a female hero and even a female action star in your movie and and I, I do think that's actually something quite remarkable. So even though it is, this Alien is not the, the big feminist film to end all feminist films, but it, it is still, I would say, pretty important film also on that territory. So most definitely, yeah, please go and check out Alien. Yeah, yeah, of course I would recommend Alien. And I would still say that it's the by far... Well, I don't know about by far, but yeah, I would definitely say that it's the the best part of the entire franchise. There are things to see in the sequels, but this works really well as a concise unit on its own. It didn't need any sequel. It's great standalone watch. No sequel waiting here. And yeah, I mean. The, the film is so good that, that Roger Ebert, who originally hated, <laughs> hated the film, actually, years later, had to go back and do a second review where he gave, gave it a glowing recommendation. And that was while watching the director's cut, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't know what cut he was, he was watching. I, uh, I'm guessing it, it was the director's cut in yeah. order to, to kind of explain explain or give an excuse for him to do the second review right but yeah great cinematography great creative alien creatures slow pacing which works for me more and more as i get older it seems uh, as, a, <laughs> as a kid as a 14 year old it's year old it's just a kind of you're just waiting for the great stuff to happen but um, it's a great stuff that's happening throughout the film you really know you're watching Alien. When... When you are in the middle of giving birth and all of a sudden re you realize that you are doing it from the wrong goddamn end. Yeah, it's, it's just... Um, what is it called? C-section. C-section. This is horribly violent and starts from wrong end. <laughs> no anesthesia used of any kind and... You really know you 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 really know when you're watching Alien when your antagonist tries to take a nap from all that exhausting killing and the term milkshake has a new definition. I suppose that uh, was once again one of the anal rapes of one of those classics in this podcast. <laughs> but. Thank you for joining us anyway, and in the meantime, and in the between time us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. And there's this web page, which I happen to rem remember this time. It's called the www.theflicklab.com. Don't forget to leave us, leave us a rating, as stated. Next week, what is our next week's film? I have no idea. And neither do I. I. I guess it's a mystery and we see it then. Well, let's see what we can cook up for you next week. As for now, I'm done eaten by mosquitoes and next week hopefully I will record to your people from the comforts of Finland. Where you, be, where you are also being eaten by mosquitoes. Because Most? it is Finnish summer and the only difference between Finnish summer and Finnish winter is that and during summertime, you also get mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, most likely. It's gonna be my summer house, and I actually have no single motherfucking clue 
if the internet is even going to be working properly there at the moment. I, I, I guess we find answers to more than one question <laughs> next week. Until then. Until then. You're closing? Yes. Okei. Okay. No niin, ne sulkee. Minäpä siirrän perseeni niin jonnekin. Mitä vittua, nyt ei oo. Piti olla kympiltä, mutta... Oh. Ei se mitään, mä menen tohon yhdelle tason teille. Mä kannan koko paskan tästä ja kävelen tohon. Okei. Okay. Katufka. Joudutko sä nyt seisoskeleen koko nauhoituksen vai? Joo, ei se haittaa. Ei mitään uutta. Hienoa. Hienoa. <laughs> Ääni kulkee vaan paremmin. <tri> Joo, nyt äh, sori, tää ei ollut ehkä paras idea nyt ihan lähteä tänne fasaanipuistoon. Tota, mulla on semmonen kutina, että ne pistää nyt ovet kiinni sitten kuitenkin. Kun mä ajattelin, että tosta, tosta baarittiski muikkelista, että jos ne on kerran 10 asti auki, niin kyllä se puistokin on sitten 10 asti auki, mutta nyt mä epäilen kaikkea, niin mä voisin lähteä kyllä tästä hipsiin, ettei käy taas se, mikä oli viime kerralla, että jäin tänne sisään. Voidaanko ottaa joku 20 minuuttia tauko ehkä? Vedetään sitten aika nopeasti loppuun. Ai, ai, ai. Olipas kiva asento. Mä olin tässä penkillä vähän mutkalla. Ja, kaatko sen nauhoituksen?